Hello everybody, welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today I'm live streaming a watercolor painting. It'll be a landscape painting. Um, just kind of playing around fast and loose. Since I'm live streaming this, the setup is gonna take a few minutes. So if you're watching this at a later date on YouTube or Patreon, feel free to, excuse me, skip ahead. So let me get my live stream chat set up. Sometimes it takes a few moments for my Kindle on the side to get that ready. And that should be working. We'll take our quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. We'll soak this paper. So this is a large hake brush that I'm just gonna use to get everything wet. And while the paper stretches we'll get the palette ready see if any adjustments need to be taken Okay, so while that soaks up, let's see what needs to be adjusted, and we'll come up with some sort of plan for what we want to paint today. With my palette, I use a butcher tray. This one I'd gotten from Michael's, and they're probably five to ten dollars. Um, I know Hobby Lobby and I think Blick and. <laughs> All those other art websites probably sell it. And you can either get them plastic or kind of like a enameled metal. This is the enameled metal, and I, I prefer that one. All right. I think color-wise, we should be good on the palette. If we need to add anything, we'll We'll kind of just go with the flow. I haven't watercolored in a few days. Um, work had started back up this week. So I had my oil set up and I just kind of jump into an oil painting at the end of the day. Just kind of a quick one. So really haven't had too much painting taking place. This is common at the beginning of every one of these videos that we press down the binder clips and push the paper down and this helps it stretch out. Let's grab some raw sienna and we'll get started on a sky. Kind of figure out where I want my horizon line to be. And as we play around, we'll come up with some sort of plan. Like, like I said, there's really no direction for this painting. It's just a, a painting just to paint, and there'll be a landscape painting. I've been messing around with still lives a lot, and, um, and the oils. I've been playing around with gouache as well, and playing with the still lives there. So it's just kind of in a, I guess you'd use the word transitory state, art-wise. Just gonna bring this raw sienna down. Come out with an idea. We'll go very soft with this guy. So that'll be the plan. We'll go soft. And um, and dark, so we'll kind of do like something in the tonalist direction, which is where I strive for with all my landscape paintings. But that's gonna be the goal here. I'm gonna grab just a tiny smidgen of Venetian red. If you don't have that, you can use light red oxide. 
In fact, I have light red oxide on the palette, but I'm just going for the Venetian. Softly play that out. Now we're painting wet and wet, so we're going to get a diffusion. And with this diffusion, it's going to soften up. And then as it dries, it'll dry lighter. So we're going for a dry, light sky. I may have already went overboard with the Venetian red right there. If we do water, we'll bring down a little bit of this red down into it. We'll figure it out as we go. We're looking for a sunrise, um, maybe sunset type effect. And like I said, with work starting back up, I was actually driving to work yesterday morning. You know, I'd be driving to work every morning that I have work. And um, it was definitely a fiery red sunrise. Um, I think I might have taken a picture of it. I often do take pictures of the sky, but I seldom use them. That's something I need to um, to correct and wind up utilizing and bring that over into the art. But anyway, um, it reminded me of somebody, like somebody alive, just like a kind of a random person on a, on a Facebook page for painting. I had made a comment, something along the lines of, you know, in order to be a tonalist painter, or a landscape painter, you need to get up in the early in the morning and take photos and see. And I think um, J. M. W. Turner, the famous landscape painter from England, the early 1800s, he um, was very famous for uh, watching you know sunrises and whatnot. Not really too much of an issue and just playing around thinking um, I think I'm gonna use a concept that we haven't talked about in a while um, there's a book a landscape painting book I haven't read it in its entirety yet but it has very good um, pieces of information in it it's Carlson's guide to landscape painting 1920s you can find it on Amazon. You can find used copies on uh, eBay and other places as well. And Carlson has a very interesting approach to uh, tonal values. It's Carlson's uh, theory of angles, where everything's relationship to the source of light. Let's do the source of light in this region. It affects how light everything is in value. But in general, the sky is going to be the lightest, the ground will be the second lightest, and the trees will be, or vertical structures, will be the darkest. And due to this light being so low on the horizon, we're going to have a lot of dark taking place because it's not catching much of that light. And then anything that goes up vertically are going to be pretty dark. Right now we're just pushing pigment around, letting the composition create itself. A little bit of Venetian red and um, ultramarine mixed together 
give you a purple. And I'm using this for aerial perspective, so objects that are far away. Now, theoretically, they're going to be pretty light in value, being that they're far away. I may have to increase their intensity due to the light source being behind them and them not having much light. Or they might be, just be super far, far distance, and then I'll do another layer of trees on top of those where that darkness will take place. thinking light source here, shadows out, shadows out. So I'm just making up this scene using a little bit of linear perspective. We're gonna have a small area of water right in here, that's what I'll do. Now for some odd reason I haven't been using raw sienna lately, sorry burnt sienna, in any one of my um, mediums like oil, um, gouache, watercolor, I just haven't been using burnt sienna and I'm not sure why. Because burnt sienna is usually a staple on palettes and for a long while I used it a lot. Maybe I felt like I used it too much. But um, the mixture of these two is a good way to kind of get a gray or dark. So I'm going to mix those for kind of that dark, colorless tree line. I'm just using the hake right now. Of shapes. Certain areas of the paper you can tell are already starting to dry, especially this area right in here. Um, we have diffusion in some spots, and in others we have a crispness, which is nice to get that variety, the lost and found edges. edges. I just wasn't anticipating it happening so quickly. And that's, um, that's the main thing. Practice with your paper and know the different stages of um, the wetness, the moistness of the paper. I know some people don't like that word, so I apologize if you made anybody cringe um, with that. Sorry about that. Um, but if you pay attention to the, the level of the, the wetness, um, where it's super saturated when we first started out, um, then as it slowly starts drying, we start getting different effects. We start getting different distribution. So wet and wet, practice with that and be um, aware of what's taking place. Don't let it, don't, don't let it rush you. Even though we're painting fast and loose, um, still work at a speed that you're comfortable with and you'll get eventually to a speed that's, um, that's you know, fast and comfortable. It's kind of like people practicing their musical scales where you practice them slow and then they start building together. Here's the edge of that water right there. And as you put the pigment down, as you put the paint you're wetting that spot, so you can then treat that area as a wet area. So even though everything was wet at the same time, this sky is drier than this area where I just laid that tree line in. Put a little bit darker down towards the base, trying to get a little tonal variety in this. Other things to keep in mind, um, you know, a lot of people say work light to dark, which I guess I'm adhering to. I'm not really sure. I really haven't thought too much about that. 
I always think um, increased pigment load, increase the amount of paint that's on the brush as I work. Uh, I may be applying the concept to the wrong scenario, but when you have more pigment and you're going in wet and wet, you're less likely to get the um, cauliflower effects. So I'm bringing the shadows down, letting them diffuse the reflections. And I'm just increasing the pigment. In fact, you probably see that I haven't really wet this brush much in the past few minutes. Eventually I get to the point where I'm struggling to get paint off the palette and I'll have to um, get some more water with it, but what I'm doing is just increasing the pigment as I'm moving closer, increasing the tonal value, getting it darker. One thing I like to keep in mind, um, you'll often hear people say, don't um, put too much detail in the foreground because you don't want the uh, viewer to get lost in the foreground and never make their way visually into a painting. But one thing that I've seemed to notice is that there's often a lot of detail in the foreground because it's gonna be closer. However, um, tonally it's often very close together. So you could have a lot of different brush strokes and whatnot but because there's not so much contrast, your eye isn't um, getting stuck there. Now, when this dries, it's gonna soften up quite a bit. Um, in fact, in a bit, I'm probably gonna use the blow dryer to dry it off and you'll be able to see that tonal shift that takes place. Uh, I've mentioned this a lot in the past. Think of blacktop or cement. Whenever it's wet, it looks darker. As it dries, it looks lighter because the light is uh, being refracted through that water and uh, changing. So that's why it looks darker. But you, you just need to know that and be prepared for that drying to take place. Now, even though this is mostly dry up here, I want to try to exploit just a little bit of that softness. Hopefully it'll take place and plan out very gentle, small foliage for trees. I'm gonna have a tall tree come up back here, we'll go back up in here. Unfortunately, we're probably not gonna get any diffusions take place. If it was a little bit wetter, we'd be more prone to that. And it makes for a really nice effect to um, put it in at this stage when it's a little bit wetter. And um, then from there, you can then dry it and then do another layer, a little bit more crisp on top. But while we're here, there, let's see, a little bit more concentrated area. I'm not using any different pigment, I'm just using that same ultramarine burnt sienna mix. You want to keep in mind. Remember how I mentioned earlier, as um, after I put in the trees here, this area is now wetter compared to here. And I was able to kind of um, feed in some colors a little bit darker, get some a little bit tonal variety down in these trees. The same thing starts to take place whenever you're putting in uh, foliage. Here I am stippling it in, but it's starting to get that area wet. So if I was to put another tone on t uh, color on top, let's say I just grab the raw sienna. Instead of getting the crispness that I was starting to get, I'm now gonna get a softening because that area is now wet due to the pre
previous application that I just did. So um, whenever you're building up foliage, you may want to decide to do a little bit of dry off at that point and kind of go uh, back and forth like a dry off, stipple, dry off, stipple. Just adding a little bit along this water's edge. I like to go above and below for that reflection. Let's see. I'm going to grab the number four rigger. So we're going to switch brushes. I'm going to grab Payne's Gray. And my tree trunks are going to be in this region. I'm just going to bring a little bit of their shadows down. The reflection, sorry. I don't want the distance to be the same between them. I know I haven't made the put the trunks in yet. This is just um, since the area is still wet, I like to um, go the wet and wet. This one will most likely get lost underneath the mat, but I like to paint edge to edge. I'll even feed in paint spray around this this turn right here. So we'll wind up having the trees come up once I do a dry off. If I paint right here the tree trunks, I'm going to get a diffusion, and I don't want that to happen right now. So let's see if there's any other spots we want to do this. I want to vary my rhythm. Could have a, excuse me, one that'll come up and over, and it'll do a reflection that's kind of on an angle. Then we can make things interesting by having a dead tree branch falling in here and lead the eye up and over. So I'm just playing around, just kind of thinking about things. So you're just seeing my mind in action. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. But um, I think it'll help you all out. Or maybe you'll see what not to do or what not to think. Light's gonna come from here, we're gonna cast a shadow. When I dry off, I'll, I'll come back in and I'll emphasize that. Let's put another reflection here. There, there we go. Okay, so now we'll do a dry off and we'll put in these trees that I'm making reflections for. Okay, so if you have earbuds on, take them off or turn them off because blow dryer is about to go on. Also pay attention to any drying that takes place, especially the paint's gray. That's going to lighten up quite a bit. Now, with um, the drying off stage, you can feel the back. If it still feels a little cool, it's still a little damp, but we're fine enough right now, we won't have any um, mishaps. Also pay attention to these guys. It didn't happen in this uh, one, but if you're painting wet and wet and you're pooling a lot of paint, they like to congregate in that spot, the water, and then whenever you're doing the whole dry off, it'll like start messing with you and you'll start getting cauliflowers and uneven surfaces. 
I apologize. I keep on, uh, I don't know if it's showing up on the film. I keep on um, burping. Uh, I don't know why I'm so burpish. I'm sorry. I had a big lunch today and took a nap after that, so that might be what it was. So I'm going to take my number four rigger. Uh, I might switch to a number one just for thinner lines. I don't have such a delicate hand as some people do, but I'm going to try to just go nice and light with this. Maybe it'll even allow little breaks to take place. And while I do this, I want to pay attention to see how I did that branch come off right here. If I do another one right here, I don't want to do that in the same spot. I want to vary my rhythm. Um, we have something like this. And while I'm doing this, I'll kind of blab for a little bit. The reflections come out here. So those are kind of be radial lines from that if we want to have reflections take place. Today we did the round two of hurricane prep shopping. They um, have the two storms that are going to enter the Gulf, Marco and Laura. And yesterday, after work, after practice, I went and um, picked up a case of water and some other stuff. You know, just in case um, anything happens. And being a school teacher during COVID, they've turned off all the uh, faucets, the fountain, sorry, the fountains, water fountains at school. This one's going to be off the uh, page when we put a mat over it. So even if we don't drink all the water, um, I need water bottles for my classroom, you know, for myself because we don't have any. Uh, running drinking water where I work, which I think has been pretty common throughout the world or the nation turning off drinking fountains during this uh, time. Here's that reflection. Just get a little eye movement. I could use the side of the rigger for a textured effect, very gently dry brushing sideways. It's something I'm not that proficient at, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, people that are masters of it on YouTube, uh, two people that will do great jobs with the round brush or with the rigger doing that, um, Alan Owen and David Usher. So those are two people to check out, watercolor-wise, with um, a brush technique like that. They're fast and loose painters. In fact, they're the people that I, some of the people that I watched before I started doing videos myself. Practiced. Use that to do some foliage there. I'm doing that around the base. Now this one has a little too much water on the brush. So that's another thing, not even just knowing the water content of the paper, being aware of that. Also being aware of the water content of the brush and how to handle it. And that's probably the key besides just a light touch with this um, dry brush effect. Also knowing water content. Uh, trees are pretty sparse. So you can build them up if you want to. You could use the heel for a different type of mark. Let's grab this ultramarine and 
raw sien burnt sienna. Just that's what I've been using. Here's that. Falling down. Kind of getting the eye move along it. Just using it for calligraphy type strokes, letting the um, brush move itself, catch and flick, etc. back here so I'm gonna just uh, scrub it in a little bit side stroke in the corners now let's do a dry off so give your buds on watch your ears we'll do overall look super dry but in that moment looking at the spacing here um, like I said these guys are pretty sparse and I'm not too ecstatic about that setup so I'm gonna mix up this dark that I've just been using the ultramarine and the uh, burnt sienna in fact maybe that's what we'll focus this um, video on just continue and use ultramarine burnt sienna Let's put a foreground tree. And just let it play itself out. This is the number four rigger, silver black velvet brand. It's a affordable brush. You don't need that many different brushes. So if you follow the fast and loose, usually just a big tough sort of brush, and then a small liner script rigger brush. Help. Um, to a secondary tree alongside it. And we'll go back to our hake. And much like before, we'll stipple in foliage. Now, you want to be wary of the same pattern occurring, so watch out for that. It's kind of like a stamp. If you use the stamp over and over again, pop, 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 you get that same image taking place. So I'm trying to um, vary it. Vary the density and the closeness of the brushes. Um, With this closer one, we can definitely vary the density, the darkness. Just brushing up for long grass effect. So 
since we do have a closer tree, we can talk about that. Um, here's the number one rigger. It's just easier for me to get finer lines with it. Uh, like I said, I'm pretty heavy handed. Um, so here I'm resting my hand on the edge of the pallet. But actually, here is one of those magnets that you extend that mechanics use to pick up stuff. It's a magnet, so it connects to that pallet. But I could lean my hand against that, and it extends. It's telescoping. It's about six dollars off of Amazon. So it's a good addition. Just be careful with any electronics that you have around because you know mag magnets might mess that up. If you don't have a hake, um, there's the side brush technique with uh, large round brushes or the squirrel mops in order to create foliage. There's uh, people use fan brushes to create foliage. And it's usually at this point where it's just how much you want to fiddle with it. If you want, well now, oh, I gotta give my little spiel. Okay, if you ever want to copy any of these paintings, if you ever want to follow along with these tutorials, feel free. Um, like you have my permission to go ahead and follow along, sign it with your own name, and if somebody offers to buy it, feel free to go ahead and sell it. You have my permission. Um, because I want you guys to, you know, succeed and, you know, put money in your pocket for more art supplies. Uh, I would like you to consider supporting me on uh, Patreon or, or anything like that, but if not, excuse me, it's totally fine. I understand. So, that's my spiel, just getting it out of the way. Now, let's uh, dry off and see how it looks. Let's put a mat over it. Now, uh, I may have a few more videos up this week, mainly if they cancel work, you know, since I work at a school due to um, the potential, you know, hurricanes. But it might be time to replace this mat. It's been so put through so much. Let's see what it looks like. Anyway. I may have a lot more uploads this week if we don't have work with the two hurricanes coming. So, there you go. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, please like, subscribe, follow, and I'll talk to you all soon. Have a great day. Bye.